Hello, I'm Morse Kohansky, Wilderness Living Skills and Survival Instructor, getting on in years. Just had my 77th birthday, and um, these days I stick close to home, and uh, it breaks my heart that I can't attend the symposium that I've attended uh, numerous times before. So, to contribute my bit through Karamat, I uh, decided to produce a video for the benefit of the people attending the symposium. Now, knives are probably one of the hottest topics. Uh, we all wonder what we would consider to be a survival knife. So we'll take a stab at it. We know that certain knives have names that are undistributable, like this is a filleting knife. This is uh, actually a gutting knife because the front end here is quite dull so that you specifically use that for gutting when you do a lot of gutting. A skinning knife with a pronounced a, a very round edge, the butcher knife. Notice no, no guard on many of these. Some of these, the way the handle is situated, the maker is trying to do us a favor to uh, help us uh, keep our hand where the knife handle is. This is a, a very, very traditional hunting knife from uh, the German tradition. Uh, uh, the, the note the uh, special curvature of the cutting edge. A very common knife well known amongst uh, people in the area of carpentry in Sweden. This is called a Sloyd knife. These knives were specifically made for the use of children in the school system. And here is a Mura knife with the Scandi grind, very well used. It came from the effects uh, that I, my father, when he passed on, and uh, I cleared his garage here. This knife was there, and I, it says Sandvik, which is uh, rather rare. You don't often see the name Sandvik on the knife, but obviously my father had the knife for a long time, and this is a very traditional, typical, almost stereotypical knife the most common knife probably in Scandinavia, the uh, not too big, not too small, and in particular the uh, way the uh, uh, grind is set up, which is called the Scandi grind, which means that the bevel face near the cutting edge, all you have to do is hold that against the sharpening surface, and so a learner will will uh, put an edge on the knife very proficiently in a very short time. And then we come to uh, uh, a set of knives that would be maybe, in my way of thinking, might sort of be suitable in survival. Whether you call it a survival knife or not, that's another story. Now the knife collection here, so far, uh, in my experience, uh, these are knives that were based on the chapter in Bushcraft that I wrote. I might have actually written the article on this particular knife, which was handmade by myself about 30 or 40 years ago from a bandsaw steel, a, a, a type of springy metal that uh, 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 could be worked with simple tools, that is, with a cold chisel and a, a vice and a, 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 a grinding wheels and so on, that on the average we could produce a knife like this in, in half an hour, 20 minutes. That's a bit of a story about uh, why we were engaged in this. We had the opportunity to make many of these knives because the students uh, were issued a a knife in the RCAF survival school program and if they didn't bring their own knife the reissued knife was so dull and had such a poor edge that we ended up finding we had to lend people uh, knives. Well when we made them ourselves and they were so easily and quickly made we didn't care whether they were returned or not and this was the end result because we played around with every 
size and shape of blade, right from maybe blades that are only two fingers long, something like the length of the Sloyd knife. And we found that on the average, a good handle, uh, a blade that's uh, about four fingers, five fingers, somewhere around there, not excessively big, a continuous curvature from the tip to the end of the handle, no wastage of space. There are not many knives here that, the, that have this waste of space between where the handle ends and where the cutting edge begins. The, uh, that's sort of a thing that I, that I despise <laughs> greatly. But at any rate, uh, my guru and myself figured that this was a very functional knife. Not too expensive, uh, of a configuration that uh, would work well in the hands of a learner. And like this knife would peel the bark off of sticks to cut through sticks and so on. We're per perfectly happy. But if we were to say that you wanted to have a knife that would also allow you to cut yourself out of an aircraft, then it would have to be a lot more robust, which in most of the cases here, the first thing we might notice about the knives here is they are robust. The second thing you'll notice is that they favor the Scandi grind. And where possible, the issue is, is a continuous curvature from the tip to, to where the handle begins. And again, no wastage of, uh, uh, of blade by, by having any great amount that's near that. Uh, near, near the end. All these uh, are made in a in a way where it would be very difficult to break them. In the, in the description of a knife that might be useful in a survival kit, we would say that it's a pry bar that works wood really, really well. And when we say works wood really, really well, all of these knives would carve this netting shuttle. Myself, I probably would do it in four minutes, starting from a, a split out piece of shingle to, I would allow 12 minutes, I'd allow 10, 15 minutes for a student to carve one of these. But if your knife does not easily carve this device, I think it is lacking in uh, a certain element of usefulness. Now the, the knife too, the next thing, is what does it do for you when it comes to um, uh, shaving wood uh, to uh, light fire, to produce sticks that don't catch fire easily into kindling, which is something that catches fire on the count of five. So here we say a robust knife, difficult to break, continuous curvature, and a Scandi bevel so that you can maintain a razor's edge on it. The limiting size, you generally find that you want a knife to be um, unobtrusive. Now in the selection here, we have some knives that are in themselves uh, fairly, fairly elegant. Uh, but the uh, issue here now comes with holes in the handle. So here, for, for example, you could lash this to, uh, to a stick by putting paracord through the holes in the handles. Here it occurs that the manufacturing process, the rivets have been eliminated so that the holes uh, with, that are suitable to allow a threading through a paracord. But at any rate, now you have an Eiffel. Uh, this is uh, um, Joe Flowers from, from Condor. This is Roger Harrington from Bison Enterprises in the United Kingdom. This is Rod Garcia from Whitefish, Montana. And this is uh, Jim. Jim? James. James. I keep forgetting his, uh, he's got a very uh, Norwegian name. Andel. Andel, Andel, James Andel, recent comer. Uh, and then, uh, um, oh, uh, Jason Gustafsson might have something to do with this knife. 
uh, and I know that uh, Ben uh, uh, Persma, uh, those names come up. Uh, these are recent additions, so as a result, in my old age, the more recent the knife, uh, the, the, the foggier my memory. At any rate, I would consider uh, uh, the knives you're looking at here uh, definitely fulfill the requirement of being a useful tool. On the one extreme, strong enough to cut your way out of an aircraft if you're a pilot. On the other extreme, a general, inexpensive, readily procurable, easy to maintain a, ra a razor's edge. And that might be all I want to say about knives for the time being. The topic for the moment is, I would say, the items that put us into the space age. There are three things that play a big role in my uh, a way to relate to the wilderness. Uh, possibly we might say that at the top of the list is a cord that is called paracord, parachute shroud line, that now is coming out in wide variety of styles and colors. I even have one where the person has gotten the manufacturers to include fish line. Uh, if you don't know the anatomy of parachute shroud line, the uh, real shroud line has got 7 to 12 strings inside of a tube. So when we go to describe parachute uh, shroud line, I use the approach by calling it 550 200 dash 7 or dash 12. So 550 means the tensile strength, 200 is, uh, reminds us of the safe working load and uh, the final number tells us how many uh, strings there are involved. Here in this case it's, uh, it is 7. I don't know why they choose 7. 7 and then 12. Um, so a real para, a paracord has uh, the strings and the imitation paracord very often has a kind of a fuzz uh, material that uh, uh, is, uh, makes it a lot less expensive. Now the uh, second item is the metal match, the rod that uh, when you scrape it, the huge lighter flint, you get a shower of sparks. Well, that's just a immense lighter flint. Probably started as that way back when uh, Ronson uh, uh, lighter uh, makers uh, came up with a material that was very sparky. Uh, some of the early stuff I was led to believe was um, uh, a strategic material now in the atomic energy situation and so the rods we get today are some kind of alloys. Now here we have a knife that has the rod incorporated as does the uh, other survival knife. So if you're going to have the knife and you've got the rod, you've got both of the important tools for fire lighting. And in this case there's a ingenious uh, uh, situation where there is a piece of inner bicycle inner tube and in that is the rod instead of it having a, a case and uh, as well the inner tube keeps a little sharpening device handy um, so that uh, you could carry other things with this. I also like to uh, put a tweezer with mine for removing slivers. So in my part of the world, the issue of picking up a, sli uh, <clears throat> a sliver. Uh, another way of packaging, uh, my friend Rob Withrow uh, come, came up with this uh, magnesium outside container, which you could scrape up for fine kindling. Uh, the unscrew it and you've got a, a very hefty rod for striking sparks. 
this is very prone to uh, virtually uh, melting almost in a very wet environment. And so you might uh, carry other things here. You might carry a, a bunch of uh, cotton saturated with uh, Vaseline in that end, or uh, in I think Rod Withrow said this was to this was made for some kind of military organization where the amphetamines might be carried in the other end. But when you put all of them together, it becomes a, a, a defensive tool called the Yarwa stick. And somewhere in my files, I have a small booklet on how you use this as a tool of combat. So we have many forms uh, of this, but this talk is uh, being shortened. So, uh, so again, the uh, paracord, you find that there's a certain knot that is used called a jam knot and with that you construct just about everything under the sun when it comes to implements and survival like ski shoes, pack frames, buck saws, whatever. And the third item is a tough plastic. Now it's tough in certain ways. It's called mylar. I call it mylar. Uh, here's a package that says emergency blanket. Uh, I have a, a collection of information. When they say emergency blanket, they turn this marvelous survival device into a potentially dangerous thing because if they call this a blanket and you use it like a blanket, it's the worst possible way to use it. That is, you shouldn't call it a blanket, you should call it a, a sheet, a reflective sheet because we transfer the term blanket to something that has thickness, like a wool blanket. And a wool blanket is used in a different universe compared to this material. Anyway, that's my line. You often see it in uh, space vehicles. You see this used in outer space and it's probably the source of this. But when it came available to us in sheets, a uh, if you know how to use it, it's worth its weight in gold. If you don't know how to use it, you get into trouble, worse trouble than you intended. You've got to keep in mind that this is a windproof, moisture-proof material. And if you wrap yourself with it, there's a grace period, probably about an hour before the moisture that evolves from a living human uh, begins to collect between this material and then that sort of turns around and starts to chill you in that it becomes a, like a radiator thing you might say. Now there are various forms. It came on the uh, scene very quickly so that the manufacturers, they take the idea of blanket and produce a rectangle of this stuff the size of a wool blanket which is neither here nor there. I've always said that if they charged five times as much and gave me something three or four times as big that uh, that would be so much better than something that's too small for general application. It's exactly, uh, uh, it's the size of a wool blanket and a wool blanket uh, has other functions and if you're trying to replace this a wool blanket with this, that's where you get into trouble. Now, more sophisticated versions of this uh, look like this, so that the uh, fluorescent orange makes you visible, and the inside is very shiny. Uh, all this mylar reflective sheets must be very shiny, and it's got threads in it to uh, keep it from tearing. And it's a decent size. So this is probably three times the size. Uh, it was given to me by a student. I don't know where the source is. A uh, person would probably have to look for it a great deal on the internet. When I ta ta uh, told Don Cavellas that the ideal survival tarp would be black on one side and uh, shiny like a mirror on the other, in his resourcefulness, he looked on the internet till he found it. And here it is. The must be horrendously expensive. 
but it's a ripstop nylon, extremely tough, very shiny, black on one side and a mirror on the other. And that's what you want in a universal type of tarp if you were to include it in a, in a uh, um, uh, survival kit where you only have the one uh, the tarp is supposed to meet every need. Now because this fabric is so rare, I think it was used for making the reflective umbrellas in photography and uh, I, uh, the, the need for that sort of thing with the electronics that's involved in photography so they probably don't make this anymore. So I don't know how the survival industry can revive this but I happen to have gotten enough to make a tarp. Otherwise, we use this, which is currently on the market. It's $2. This is $1. And this is close to four or five times as much. But when you look through it, you find it's not the same thing. <laughs> this, this is very translucent compared to the more expensive. So this costs a dollar, this costs $2, and this is a tube tent. And of course, the people that come with this camping tube tent, they don't uh, consult with a guy like me, because I would have said that you would double or triple the value of this tube tent if you left a panel in there that was clear polyethylene, and you would have the option of facing that clear panel towards a fire. Because if you crawl into a tube tent that's totally shiny, of course, that's counterproductive. So if you put up a tube tent facing the fire because a part of it is clear polyethylene, you've got the best of all possible worlds. So today you buy one of these and uh, modify it by adding a window out of polyethylene. Now I'm sure if you looked hard enough you would find uh, a clear uh, plastic material that's uh, uh, unaffected by fire because you can buy these bags where you put your turkey roast in this plastic bag in the oven. It's called Look. It's very crinkly but uh, it's uh, uh, fireproof. It won't melt and it must come in, in uh, industrial size sheets because somebody's making bags out of them for, for they went to the trouble to develop a, 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 a clear plastic. I don't know what it would be, what it's made out of. But anyway, when I discovered this on the market, which the only place I can find it is in the, the uh, Dollarama type stores, I almost fainted. And I said, finally, for two dollars I get five times as much mylar. So I've got a workable amount. Now what the whole issue is, is that when I studied the construction of the igloo and the mechanism behind what makes an igloo work, I, uh, it occurred to me, what if I tried to build a shelter that incorporated all the principles that an igloo made out of snow would have? And of course, one of the uh, principles is the high reflectivity of snow. Because snow crystals are multitudinous myriads of mirrors. And when you build a snow shelter or an igloo, you instantly feel the glow that is bounced back. So you grow to the equivalent of a 150 watt light bulb. Trouble is that your glow is distributed over two square meters of skin surface. But at any rate, if you know how to capture that. So the mylar takes the place of the reflective snow. And then uh, the uh, cheapest material there is to build most of the structure is polyethylene, so readily available. And then part of it is made out of ripstop fabric that um, if you take a fabric and put it over your mouth, I'm actually almost not suffocating by being able to suck air through it. So it's very porous. When the wind interacts with something like that, it pretty well keeps the wind out, but it's got enough porosity, and God forbid the use of breathability, 
they call these type of fabrics breathable fabrics. That is one of the most outstanding uh, terminologies of misinformation that even walks circles around the stupidity of calling this stuff a blanket. To call a fabric something that is breathable instead of saying vapor permeable or, or permeable to oxygen. So if I build a dome that captures the warmth that maybe enters through a window and then gets reflected back and forth all over the place and I have a portion of it uh, on the downward side which is a, a porous vapor permeable air porous material I've got the three things. I've got a bubble to capture the warmth that holds it in place. I've got the, the shiny interior that uh, reflects a great deal of our own glow and uh, then we've got a material that helps in creating the bubble and I call it the super shelter. So for, you know, this is probably a much bigger piece than I really need, plus 10 feet by 20 feet. Now you could cut that in half, 10 feet by 10 feet, and then you've got this tube tent that at least probably almost gives you 10 by 10 uh, if you cut the, one of the seams, and then you've got a, uh, enough. So between this, probably, well, no, not this one here, but the clear plastic and this, you're looking at the components of one of the most advanced shelters that, uh, that, the, uh, that can ever be included in a survival kit. Mylar, well we call it four because nylon, ripped up nylon, the paracord, and uh, the huge metal match, the most indestructive, most compact, indestructible, de most dependable means of lighting a fire when you're properly trained by the use of those sparks. Uh, and you got to learn uh, you know how to how to use this so that uh, you get the none of these things uh, just by buying them that's probably a quarter of the issue the other three quarters of knowing how to use these materials there is no means of lashing that can surpass the lashes you can create with paracord and there is nothing this is probably equivalent to 10,000 fires. You know, like for example, the learner goes like that. The person who is skilled in using it uses half, and then there's the person who can just use that. So here on a quarter stroke, I am probably lighting fire. So there's a big difference from being a learner to being a real pro on learning how to use something. The first when you wear out learning how to conserve it. So if I know that I can get a fire that way, this way, and this way, and eventually this gives me probably 20,000 fires because I'm so conservative because I'm only using that much of the rod.